Mia likes to highlight the fact that Ronan was responsible for the victories of the Me Too movement. The New Yorker also likes to spread this narrative. You've won the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service for your reporting on uh, the Harvey Weinstein story and sexual harassment and what became the Me Too movement. We share this because it's an institutional award as well. First off, I like how David Remnick congratulates himself for the Pulitzer. He's quick to point out that it's his award too. More importantly, he claims Ronan's reporting is what would become the Me Too movement. Let's be clear here. I want to give just credit where it's due and share key facts. Neither the New Yorker or Ronan Farrell had anything to do with what would become the Me Too movement. The Me Too movement was started by Tarana Burke back in the 90s. Now it's fair to say the movement took on unprecedented momentum more recently because it went viral. And there was one man who made the movement go viral more so than any other man, but it's not Ronan. That honor goes to Hannibal Buress. Buress was the first man to highlight the pattern of sexual assault from a powerful man. He did so during a comedy routine. Another reason why I love comedians. He did it in a comedy routine that went viral and would lead to the conviction of Bill Cosby. I just want to clarify so that the pharaohs don't erase the story of two more people of color. The journalist who disparaged Sun Yi invoked the Me Too movement as a way to discard her account. It's often talked about, but rarely defined. So let's listen to Toronto Burke define it and try to discern its principles. Uh, when you look at the Me Too movement, when, when you started your program, what was your initial goal? Our goal was really to work with um, black and brown girls in the South around, who are survivors of sexual violence to speak healing into their lives, to let them know that healing was possible and let them know that they weren't alone. And it just grew from there, it grew from working with young girls to grown women, we realized, oh, we're survivors of sexual violence, so there's others like us. And, it, and it's really been focused on what survivors need to start a healing process. That's really what the heart of our movement has been about. And also working to end sexual violence. And if you, if you look at this world that we live in now, mm -hmm. the Me Too movement has become synonymous with men being brought down. Right. I often hear people say the phrase, oh, Me Too claims another victim or another win for Me Too. Do you think that's the right way to frame it? Do you think maybe people are missing the point of what Me Too is meant to inspire? Absolutely. It feels like playing whack-a-mole after a while, right? Right. It's like, who's the next person Me Too is going to take down? And that's not really our focus. If, as a byproduct of people coming forward and telling their truth, then there's justice that happens, there's some kind of um, you know, resolution that happens right, right. from that, then that's fine. But our goal is really to support the survivors and to make sure survivors are in a place of leadership in the, in the work to end sexual violence. It's not about taking down powerful men. And it's not a woman's movement either. That's another sort of misconception. It's a movement for survivors. In other places, Tarana Burke consistently brings up these points. I found numerous examples of her saying, it's about women of color. This doesn't mean we ignore other victims, but we focus on women of color because they have been historically ignored by the public. She also says consistently, it's not about shaming men or going after them and taking them down. In this interview, she points out she doesn't believe in calling people out or in having witch hunts. She says we can't just get rid of people regardless of what they do. We need a better standard than that. She also introduces a few other key concepts, empowering empathy, reducing harm, and restorative justice. What exactly is restorative justice? It's a concept of justice that focuses on community, communication, empathy, and shared understanding. It allows offenders to take accountability while addressing the needs of the victim. It focuses on healing. It's about reconciliation rather than retribution. It's an interesting concept and disparate in its methodology, but in the few places where it's been rolled out, it does appear to work. Both the victim and the perpetrator seem satisfied with the outcome, and criminals who go through the process are less likely to commit the crime again. But restorative justice requires dialogue and listening. In other words, it's the opposite of retribution, shaming, vilification, and taking people down. So these are the key concepts of the Me Too movement according to its founder. Okay, so let's look at the abuses in Mia's home. First, we ignored the testimony and abuses of women of color like Soon Yi, Tam, and Lark. But it's also not just about women, but all victims. Yet we ignore Moses and the death of Thaddeus. And the idea of restorative justice is to try to come to a shared understanding of what happened. To me, coming to a shared understanding means reviewing all of the facts and all of the testimony and coming to a shared truth that corroborates. But that's not what we did. 
The Me Too movement is also not supposed to be about shaming men or taking down powerful men. Yet the public takedown of Woody is a witch hunt if we define witch hunts as a public persecution without credible evidence. And for those who think Tarana Burke supports all allegations of sexual assault, they haven't paid attention to her history. What was Tarana Burke doing before the Me Too movement? She was advocating for the Central Park Five. In other words, she was defending innocent boys against false accusations of sexual assault. Tarana Burke does not support baseless accusations, accusations like Dylan Farrow's. These journalists invoke the Me Too movement to disparage Soon Yi's account, but they don't even seem to be aware of its guiding principles. In the abuses in Mia's home, the Me Too movement has lost its way. Soon Yi was right when she said Mia Farrow is simply taking advantage of the Me Too movement to continue her vendetta. And all of us fell for it, hook, line, and sinker. But the public was so possessed by the wrong idea of the Me Too movement that they fell right into Mia's vendetta. <laughs> In a 2018 New York Times article, Tarana Burke also warns us of the danger of publicly sharing trauma. She was concerned that survivors were getting the wrong idea, that they felt they had to tell their story of abuse on social media or verbally in a public setting. But she points out, reliving that trauma is not necessarily healthy, and doing it publicly may not be healthy either. She says, I want to teach people not to lean into their trauma. This reminds me of something Samantha Geimer said earlier, that Me Too shouldn't just be about listening to victims writhing in pain, but it should be instead about empowering women. She also goes on to say, If Me Too offers no strength, no recovery, just a place to have your pain validated as if it's a badge of honor, an asset, rather than something you can move past, then it's time to move past Me Too. Now Dylan has every right to approach her trauma in her own way, even if it's not in accordance with Tarana Burke's advice. She leans heavily and publicly into her trauma. She has told her story twice with Gail King, once in the New York Times, once again in Vanity Fair, and multiple times on Twitter. But it's not clear if it's helped her heal. In the 2013 Vanity Fair article, she details the lasting effect of her trauma. Woody made her feel like a dog. She can't listen to jazz because of Woody. She became a cutter. She was extremely depressed, especially after Tam died. She lost a boyfriend because Woody Allen gave her sexual issues. The sight of a Woody Allen t-shirt sends Dylan into a fit of vomiting. She had physical breakdowns from opening up magazines. I'm scared of him, she says, his image. Nobody wants to think this legendary filmmaker is my worst nightmare. That's what scares me. When I picture things chasing me or happening, I think it's him. Dylan still struggles with her trauma, and in her struggle, she decided to make it very public, and she puts the blame on others who were not involved in her abuse. She calls people out by name. Like her mother, Dylan seems more interested in applying her rage than reconciling it. She uses Twitter to attack numerous actors and actresses. She accuses them of enabling a system that perpetuates sexual violence. She calls out Kate Blanchett, Louis C.K., Alec Baldwin, Emma Stone, Scarlett Johansson, and Diane Keaton. Could it be your child? Dylan also attacks Jim Belushi and Justin Timberlake and Kate Winslet. She reminds him that she will be triggered every time she sees a movie ad or a review of a movie or any time Woody's name is even mentioned. She attacks actors who have come out in support of the Time's Up movement, calling them hypocrites. She attacks Scarlett Johansson saying she doesn't understand the cause she champions. She criticized Justin Timberlake, saying he loses credibility because he continues to work with Woody. She claims she is re-victimized every time these actors ignore her or don't believe her, once again placing her trauma on them. Ironically, she points out these actors' hypocrisy in ignoring or disbelieving her, but she did the exact same thing to Moses and Sun Yi. So like Ronan, Mia's rage has made Dylan a hypocrite as well. In Dylan's world, only she can be the victim in Mia's home. The other victims should be quiet. But the Me Too movement was supposed to be about healing, not silencing other victims. It wasn't supposed to be about shaming men or actors and actresses. It was supposed to be about survivors of abuse empowering each other. 
Dylan, Moses, and Soon Yi should be able to share their story of abuse with each other and corroborate known facts and come to a shared understanding of what happened and help each other heal rather than arguing in public posts. Isn't that the philosophy of the Me Too movement? Unfortunately, they can't because Mia's rage has led to their mutual estrangement. It's a divide and conquer strategy that worked to protect Mia from the collective accusations of her children. When Mia said Soon Yi is dead to us, the rest of the kids really listened and they continue to listen to her for decades. And because of that, brothers and sisters haven't been able to help each other reconcile their abuses. Dylan has been very public about her indignities, but Soon Yi has also suffered indignities. She's just been relatively private about it. Not only did her parents disown her, she had to watch her mother shower her white siblings with more love while she was forced to clean up after them. She had to listen to her mother's vicious lies about her birth mother. And despite helping her mother take care of the house, she got slut shamed by her mother and Vanity Fair said she had subpar intelligence. Growing up, Soon Yi helped take care of Ronan and Dylan. She carried them around, bought their groceries, and now she watches these ungrateful siblings tell her that her story doesn't matter, that her voice is less important, that she is re-victimizing them. She watches her white siblings scream to the world that they care about victims while they simultaneously ignore her own story of abuse. There is a reason why Mia will never be held accountable for her crimes, and it's not just because some of her victims are dead. It's because of the good grace of Soon Yi and Moses. They just don't seem interested in getting Mia prosecuted. Unlike Dylan, they don't want to vilify their abuser. They don't need her charged for her crimes, whether in the courts or the court of social media. They appear only to want to speak their truth so the madness around Woody would end. They did something that Dylan has not been able to. Moses and Soon Yi dealt with the truth of their abuse. As horrific and as difficult as it is, they looked squarely at what happened to them. They understood the depth of Mia's rage, and they were able to evolve from it. They don't need the courts and justice system to resolve their personal trauma. They don't need celebrities to believe them. They resolve their trauma outside the public light, or as Moses points out, with self-reflection, professional help, and support from those he loves and who loves him in return. They dealt with one of the hardest things to deal with in life. And no, it's not physical abuse. It's the emotional abuse and the neglect and knowing that your mother will never love you. That for you to be happy, you have to stop trying to earn her love. That for you to become your own person, you need to stop trying to please her. You need to kill the idea that she will ever love you. And that means you need to be the villain in your mother's eyes. <laughs> have no problem stabbing your mother in the back to get what you want, do you? Of course not. If what I have done today makes me a villain, then I embrace it gladly. I'll use any means necessary to bring down a monster like you. Really now, you'd call your own mother a monster? <sighs> After being stabbed through the heart, you remain unfazed. What else could you be? Mia liked to say that Dylan didn't want to see her father after the false allegations were made. However, as with Ronan, observers noted the opposite. Miss Thompson testified that Dylan loved Woody dearly, even after the false allegations were made. Dr. Coates even testified that she thought it would be good for Dylan if she maintained a relationship with her father. It sometimes takes a lifetime to see your parents for who they truly are, and some people never do. Will Dylan ever be able to reconcile the truth of what happened to her and what Mia did to her? Recall what social workers who supervise Woody's visitations observe, that Ronan said Mia was going to use therapy and doctors to erase Ronan's love for his father. That's the extreme level of gaslighting she was willing to employ with Ronan. Did she do the same thing with Dylan? Will Dylan have the resilience to unravel decades of gaslighting and possible therapy by her mother to reconcile the truth with her older siblings? It doesn't seem likely. Dylan has since become a public advocate for victims of abuse. Like Ronan, her career has been built around Mia's rage and her lie. Rather than reconciling the many truths of her past, she doubled down on her mother's lie, and it has worked for her benefit. She has remained in her mother's good graces, unlike the many women Mia fired and the many children she discarded. Dylan has received a book deal. The scandal, the false allegations, having her name in the media garnered the book enough attention that she was offered $250,000 before she even finished writing it. 
This is rare, if not unheard of, for an unpublished writer. I don't mean to suggest that Dylan isn't entitled to her success. She is. Much like Dory turned her trauma into success, Dylan should be able to do that as well. Mia has awarded her favored children with opportunities, and Dylan went from relative obscurity to public recognition to a book deal in record time. My point is that it makes it much harder to unravel the truth of your trauma if your belief in the lie continues to reward you materially. But no amount of material reward will help reconcile Sun Yi and Moses' testimony in her own abuse. In the Vanity Fair article, Dylan admitted that the death of Tam exacerbated her depression. They were close. Could she see that it was Mia that drove her friend and sister to suicide? And if she wanted to get to the truth, my sense, based on Moses' blog, is that she would find she wouldn't have to go at it alone. She may find help from those older siblings, the ones Mia discarded, but she would have to do it without Mia Farrow. But then again, now she has a writing career based on a lie. It's a fitting trajectory. The first story Dylan ever told was a fiction. The next one will be as well. This is how the audiobook version is being described, and I don't think it's meant to be ironic. It's going to be a powerful feminist fantasy about a society based on silencing and lies. Mia Farrow silenced her adopted children, and she spread lies about them. Perhaps she will make an appearance in Dylan's book as a diabolical queen. There is a greater cost to Mia's rage, and it's a societal one. Dude, I got it. There's people out there touching kids, you know? But it's not everybody. It's a very small portion of the population, so, you know, take it down a few, because you're making it awkward out there. When we make false allegations, we add to the hysteria. When we ignore the facts and use the press to put out false narratives, we feed the myth of fake news, which has been used to shut down discourse in this country. It makes it harder to live by the principles of restorative justice, which is about having an honest dialogue, getting to the truth of what happened, and arriving at a shared understanding. When some individuals knowingly lob false accusations, it hurts the case for all victims, and it destroys lives. There was another cost to Mia's rage. The 14 months of an investigation from the New York State, the time from the team of researchers at the Yale New Haven Clinic. This is valuable time and money that could have been spent on investigating the stories of other abuses. If every victim's story could be investigated with the same diligence that we investigated Dylan's story, we would truly have a more just society. Mia's rage has also made us forget lessons we already learned. Since the 90s, we became more diligent when it came to allegations from children. We learned not to record kids on videotape reliving their trauma. We learned that children can be permanently traumatized, so we have to be careful when extracting their testimony. We learned not to force them to repeat their story of trauma over and over again over three days, and that such testimony may likely be inadmissible. In effect, we learned to be both sensitive yet suspicious about the stories from children. We also learned that the false accusations can take on a life of their own and can lead to public hysteria, a hysteria that prevents dialogue, shames innocent people, and sends innocent people to jail. We also learned from Tarana Burke that we should pay attention to the experiences of people of color since the media tends to ignore them. We learned that we should listen and create dialogue and not back false allegations or single-mindedly shame powerful men. In the case of Woody Allen and Dylan Farrow, we have unlearned all of those valuable lessons. This is perhaps why Gore Vidal calls us the United States of Amnesia. We have all been gaslit by Mia Farrow. It still affects us. Spike Lee made great films that reveal the complexity of race. Do the Right Thing and Black Klansmen lost awards in years that Driving Miss Daisy and Greenbrook won. Driving Miss Daisy and Greenbrook are goofy films about white and black people driving each other around and becoming friends. No one even cares about these films anymore. But Do the Right Thing still resonates to this day. Like Sun Yi and Moses, Spike Lee knows something about having your story stolen by a white narrative. Yet despite his bona fides, he too is not immune to Mia's rage. Well, I'd just like to say Woody Allen's a great, great filmmaker. And this cancel thing is uh, not just Woody. And I think that when you know we look back on it, it's going to see that I don't know if he just short of killing somebody. I don't know, you just, just erase somebody like they never existed. So Woody's a friend of mine, a fellow Nick fan, so I, I know he's going through it right now. All Spike Lee really said was that Woody was a friend of his. 
The conversation had nothing to do with sexual violence, but the backlash Lee received was harsh enough that he felt he had to apologize on Twitter. Mia's white rage is still erasing the perspectives of people of color, just like how she erased her abuses against those poor Asian immigrant children. Well, I'll say what the journalists won't say, and I'll say it again. Sun Yi, Moses, I believe you. I believe you because I believe in corroborated testimony that aligns with known facts. The rest of the world will ignore you. Mia, Dylan, and Ronan may want to erase your story, but I hear you, I see you, I believe you. And to the spirits of Thaddeus, Tam, and Lark, you had suffered the hubris of American liberalism, the promise of a great white hope, the dream that things are better here. You had suffered the pain that comes from being raised by an angry mother who didn't have the emotional capacity to treat you the way you should have been treated. She did not love you the way she loved her white children. She did not love you the way she loved her own image reflected in the press. She may have the rest of the world full. They may ignore you, but I know what happened to you. You were neglected, abused, discarded, but you did the best you could. I believe that, and I see you.